When we read the epistles of St. Paul, there's a tremendous sense of urgency. Just look at St. Paul's first epistle to the Thessalonians. The apostle writes, Concerning times and seasons, brothers, you have no need for anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief at night. When people are saying peace and security, then sudden disaster comes upon them, like labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, for that day to overtake you like a thief. For all of you are children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as the rest do, but let us stay alert and sober. We have this wonderful word that we use in the church to describe the end times, eschaton. Eschatology uh, is one of those words that comes from it, but it's the study of the four last things. It's the end times, that which comes later. We have the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. St. Paul and the early Christians like that reading from uh, St. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians had that very uh, very active sense of the eschaton. They waited for Jesus to come back, thought that he'd be back very, very soon, thought he would be back 10 years, 20 years, 15 years. As time went on, uh, we Christians, just like them, kind of lost a little bit of that fervor. Uh, we've forgotten that our bridegroom might come again like a thief in the night, and that we would be caught alone without oil in our lamps. We'd be stuck wallowing in fear. With these four last things, uh, we're reminded that there's always one thing that's going to happen to all of us. One day, we will die. The end is inevitable. When we die, we know that we will meet our just judge face to face. It's not something that we should be really afraid of, so much as it's something that we should look forward to. But, yet again, at the same time, it does give us that healthy desire for caution. It's a reminder for us that we need to be living our lives in a way that is pleasing to Christ. So we die. We're judged. Where do we go when we die and when we are judged? In the 13th century, the Franciscan friar Thomas of Solano wrote the ancient hymn Die Sire. Actually, Thomas, uh, you might recognize his name if you do any research, but this guy right behind my shoulder, St. Francis of Assisi, uh, he was, Thomas of Solano was one of the best uh, biographers of St. Francis. And so Thomas wrote this ancient hymn called the Die Sire. The Die Sire uh, is a very popular hymn. Uh, it's a very popular song. You've probably heard its opening notes before, and you might not have even noticed it. It's in The Shining, The Lion King, Lord of the Rings even has a scene that's based off of those opening notes. So that you can hear it, I'm going to show you a couple little clips real quick because I think it's interesting. You'll find it, once you know it, you will find it in so many hundreds of movies, in musicals, and all sorts of things. But it starts off with, Die sire, die sila, bum 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 bum. Let's check out a few real quick. Well, Simba, now's your chance to tell them. Tell them who is responsible for Mufasa's death. kids help me Clarence please please I want to live again I want to live again I want to live again 
Please, God, let me live again. Okay, following the piping. Timmy, I think I could climb over the top and be on the other side before you could even get to the top. What would you give me? Respect. Come on, guys, it's not a race. So the DA Cire comes to us from the church's funeral liturgy, from the Requiem Mass. Uh, the Requiem Mass within it. Uh, the DA Cire took the place of the sequence that was after the gradual and the tract which is kind of where right now where we have the second reading, the psalm, right before the gospel. Uh, but the Dies Sire was the sequence of the day. You'll find that we use sequences at other times in the liturgical year. Uh, Corpus Christi, um, there's a sequence on Pentecost, there's an ancient one on Our Lady of Sorrows. Used to be a bunch of sequences. Uh, they've kind of slimmed them down a little bit now and they're a little more selective about what we use. But the Dies Sire is this beautiful one that was written again in the 13th century, so it's very, very ancient. Uh, but it starts off, Die sire, die sila, solvet secum in favila. Day of wrath, O day of mourning, see fulfilled the prophet's warning, heaven and earth in ashes burning. It's kind of dark. It's kind of like, oh my gosh, what are, we, what are we singing about here? This is at a funeral? We're talking about day of wrath, ashes burning? Oh my. And then it keeps going on later. It says, oh, what fear man's bosom rendeth, when from heaven the judge descendeth, on whose sentence all dependeth. Death is struck and nature quaking, all creation is awakening to its judge and answer making. So at the end of our lives when we're judged, we're going to have to make an answer. We're going to have to be judged on what we've done with our lives. St. John of the Cross uh, has that beautiful quote that I love. That uh, He says, at the end of our lives, we shall all be judged by charity. That we'll be judged by how much we loved. We know that Christ loved us so much to the point of death. Uh, the question for us is, how are we going to die to self? How are we going to die to sin in our lives so that we can live forever with Christ? The D.A. Sire later ends at the very end with, Yet, good Lord, in grace complying, rescue me from fires undying. With thy favored sheep, O place me from the dust of earth returning. Man for judgment must prepare him. Spare, O God, in mercy spare him. Lord, all pitying, Jesus blessed, grant them thine eternal rest. Amen. So the Dies Irae takes us through, in a sense, that sort of, uh, I don't want to say battle, but that sort of encounter that the soul has when it dies. It starts off with that day of wrath, that day of doom, where everything ends. Heaven and earth uh, are ended, and we're standing there right face to face with our judge, and we have to make that answer to him of how we've lived our lives. Later on then, it takes on that tone of mercy, that tone of pleading, where we, the people here on earth, plead for those souls who have died, uh, where the soul pleads before God, and uh, the, soul, the soul asks for a mercy, it asks to be spared, it asks for Jesus blessed to grant them eternal rest. Beautiful, beautiful hymn, one of my favorite ones, and now that you know it, you're probably going to notice it everywhere. So I'm sorry, but not sorry. It'll be fun. So at the end of our judgment comes heaven or hell, period. The DAC Ray paints that for us in that beautiful picture. So the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, hell. The systematic theologian Paul Tillich asked what our area of ultimate concern is. What did he mean? It's a theological term for something that's actually pretty simple. In our lives, we have plenty of real concerns. 
We have concerns about our health, our career, and so many other aspects of the daily grind. But if we were asked, what is really our ultimate concern? On what really do we, can we base our lives, what would we say? Tillich stated that our religion has to be our ultimate concern. He was a Protestant theologian. Uh, I would kind of change that a little bit, and I would say that our ultimate concern has to be heaven. We don't want to die and go to purgatory. We don't want to die and go to hell. We want to die and we want to be there with God forever. We want to see the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We want to see him face to face, to behold his beauty, uh, to be there with him. I mean, just thinking about it, it's like, it's, it's, it's greater than what I can think of. It's, it'll, be, it'll be just amazing. Uh, but that desire, that has, to, that has to be what animates us. It has to be what gives us life. It has to be how we consider uh, what decisions we make with our lives. Do we really believe that our actions and attitudes are going to lead us towards the Lord, or are they going to lead us away from the Lord? Are we aiming for heaven or heading directly away? Do we know that the Lord is our Savior, our Redeemer, that he's the Lord of mercy, but that he's also, as the DSA reminds us, the Lord of righteousness, a just judge who's coming at a time that we do not know, like the Thessalonians uh, heard from St. Paul. This shouldn't frighten us again, but it should make us realize that all this stuff, the death, judgment, heaven, purgatory, hell, they're all very, very real. What's our ultimate concern? Going to heaven. If our ultimate concern is not the salvation of our immortal soul, then we really should reevaluate our lives.